one fine South Carolina day, my little family was driving down the road listening to the radio. Not a road like this in Seattle, but in South Carolina. On came Rudy Menke's Nature Notes, a really delightful feature by a local naturalist who talks about flora and fauna in the Palmetto State. And I got a lesson for New Testament exegesis out of it. Surprise, surprise. And you can too. A Nature Notes listener had written in for information on the Latin name for a dead shrimp lying against the pluff mud on the Charleston coast. Our two-year-old immediately piped up from her car seat, informing us all with deep conviction, lying is bad. Lying shrimp are bad, of course. My little cutie was definitely right. It makes me so mad at Red Lobster when those little crustaceans boast about being jumbo but are more, well, shrimpy. But that's not what Rudy Menke was talking about, of course. And how do I know? Well, context. That was a clue. The words surrounding lying in his sentence were, of course, part of that context. And my knowledge of shrimp and mud were part of the context, too. In my personal experience, shrimp don't lie. But my two-year-old had approximately 5% of the experience of her father. She didn't trust shrimp like I have learned to do. For all she knew, shrimp go around with their pants on fire at all times. Lie not against the truth, the Bible says. Well, shrimp are so low that they even lie against mud. To which the mud replies, what did I ever do to you? Quite Clearly, my two-year-old misunderstood what she heard on Rudy Mankey's Nature Notes, and it's her parents' fault. The fault of all adult English speakers, really. We have let our language go to seed. Multiple senses for the same set of sounds lying? That's so confusing. The solution to linguistic confusion. I know the solution to this problem. Teach your kids one and only one sense for every word and insist that no other meanings exist. For lying, for example, simply choose whether you and your family are going to mean telling an untruth or reclining. Then start a Facebook group to promote your chosen meaning. People will listen. And thankfully, English has plenty of alternative words to choose from. My suggestion, make lie refer to reclining and use prevaricate for telling an untruth. Your kids will love singing out. Prevaricate, prevaricate, your pants ignited. They'll have to say ignited because fire means to relieve someone of his job. But then we can't say that a dog pants because pants are for legs. We'll have to say he lolls but then people won't be able to laugh out loud in text messages. Oh, this is so complicated. Okay, this is gonna take a while. It's a funny thing, language. It just doesn't obey the rules that we make up for it. Children are hardwired by God, I would argue, to mimic the language they hear around them. When everybody they know uses lying to mean both fibbing and resting, they will pick it up. When everybody says nauseous in place of nauseated, kids will do the same and live happily ever after. What they won't do is keep a silly rule that their parents make up forbidding such usages. So why, parents, do some of us tell our poor progeny not to use the word love to express their feeling for ice cream? Am I the only one who's heard parents do this? We parents will correct our kids when they say, No, dear, we'll say you like it, you don't love it. We parents, when we do this, are no better than the eight-year-old who says with an exaggerated grin, If you love the ice cream, why aren't you marrying it? That eight-year-old knows perfectly what his friend means, and that eight-year-old will be heard saying per exactly the same thing five minutes later and with no self-consciousness or irony whatsoever. So will said parent, who will say in the next minute, I love ESPN, I love shrimp, I love sleeping. People do what comes naturally to them in language, and they can only be forced to deviate from their linguistic grooves with considerable effort. Because our cultural institutions reward those who speak proper English, and it does really exist, it's worth learning. That's why we'll never hear that someone took sick in my house. I will correct my children. But sometimes the effort to deny what feels linguistically natural is arbitrary, even silly. 
like when we insist that the New Testament writers use a given word the same way every time. Love provides just as good an example in Greek as it does in English. In 1 Corinthians 13, love is the highest of the Christian virtues. The Greek word in that context just happens to be agape, a word that I've discussed many times before, wrote a dissertation on, sort of. And when Bible interpreters get to this fact, they sometimes get excited. Now's their linguistic chance. It is commonly believed among American Christians that this word agape in the Greek has a special meaning, a richly theological meaning from which it never deviates. It means we frequently hear, and here I'm going to quote Kenneth Wiest, self-sacrifice for the benefit of some other person who is one's enemy and naturally unlovable. That was from an old Bibliotheca Sacra article, the Dallas Seminary Journal, from way back in July, September 1959. And maybe in some context of the New Testament, this word agape or the verb form agapao does mean all this, or at least a lot of it. Jesus' love for us, demonstrated in his drinking of the bitter cup, was surely an act of self-sacrifice. No man took his life, he said. He instead laid it down. Yes, and we certainly didn't deserve that sacrifice. In the preeminent example of love in all of Scripture, greater love hath no man than this, we see something similar to the meaning that Greek word agape is commonly supposed to have. But what happens when we insist, like linguistic helicopter parents, that the New Testament always use the word the same way every time? Grammarian Kenneth Wiest wrote that the content of the meaning of agapao in the New Testament is fixed and should be so noted in its every occurrence. So agapao can't mean love of ice cream, it always means self-sacrificial love for the unlovable. What about 1 John 2.15, in which we are told not to agape the world? What about 1 Timothy 4.10, in which Demas is said to have forsaken Paul out of love, agape, for this present world? What about the Pharisees' tendency to love, with agape love, the best seats in the synagogues? That's Luke 11.43. Wiest acknowledges these deviations from his norm without explaining why he'd make such an absolute statement as the one I just quoted. His statements in the article about the meaning of agape the, and the verb form agapao are confusing but not wholly wrong. A better view of word meaning, a better way to view the meaning and use of words in the New Testament and out of it, is provided by linguist Max Turner in his essay on semantics in the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. You've just got to hear all of this quotation. A cardinal test of lexical sense is whether native language users regard proposed sentences as linguistically anomalous. Do you follow that? Listen to the example. It is a bicycle, but it has two wheels. That would be recognized as a denial of the very sense of the word bicycle. Conversely, the often suggested sense of Greek agape as selfless, self-giving love, and that would be in contrast to eros, which is sexual love, or Phile, which is supposed to be friendly or liking love, a warmth, that is demonstrably falsified, Turner says, by such statements as, and people loved darkness rather than light. And of course, it uses the root word of agape. In other words, agapao, agape, cannot mean, cannot mean in the New Testament, selfless love for the undeserving everywhere. It just doesn't fit the usage. It's anomalous. The fact is that Loving, like rejoicing and hoping and thanking, is flexible in the New Testament, like it is in English today. You can love good things, Matthew 22, 37. You can love bad things, Luke 11, 43, that I already mentioned. You can love important things, Matthew 22, 39, love God. And you can love minor things too much, 2 Peter 2, 15. You can rejoice over a saved sinner, Luke 15, 10, and you can rejoice over a discovered coin. That's also in Luke 15, Luke 15, 9. You can hope in Christ, Ephesians 1, 12, and you can hope to see Jesus do a magic trick. See Herod in uh, Luke 23, 8. The precise kind of loving meant in any given usage is clear enough from the context. Loving isn't really a precise concept anyway. 
we all just kind of know what it means, even though it's really difficult to define exactly. That's why Jesus can say love for God and love for neighbor comprise the greatest commandments of the Bible, and yet never in all of Scripture is love defined with anything remotely like a dictionary definition. John Frame observes wisely, the self-giving nature of God's love is not found so much in the word, agape, as in the teaching of the scripture about God's love. The main reason, I think, that's, this is Frame again, that the New Testament writers chose the unusual word agape to refer to God's love is that the Septuagint translators used this word to translate the common Hebrew word for love, achava. Therefore, the New Testament use of agape reiterates and expands the concept of the love of God in the Old Testament. Its nuances, therefore, this is still frame, are best discovered through Bible study rather than a study of Greek lexical stock. You know just what your daughter means when she says, I love chocolate milk. You know just what she means when she says, I love you. If you don't, you don't need a dictionary you probably just need to spend more time with your daughter. If you want to know what the Bible means when it says men love darkness rather than light, if you want to know what it means when it says love your neighbor as yourself, the nuances are, as Frame says, best discovered through Bible study rather than through a study of Greek lexical stock. Spend more time with your Bible and obeying your Bible and you will know. On that South Carolina day a few years ago, my two-year-old heard about a dead shrimp lying, and her brain went ding, and her mouth went, lying is bad. She let that loud ding drown out everything else in the context. Don't read your Bible that way. Word studies have their place, right? I hope to do some on this channel. Lexicons, too, have their place, but the Bible isn't a list of key theological words accompanied by concise definitions. It's a story full of poems, smaller stories, letters, commandments, instructions, explanations, songs, and other kinds of human writing. In a funny way, all the hard work of developing your exegetical skills is aimed at making sure that you're good at what comes naturally, just reading.